Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Eric Amble. He's going to share some stories about the time that he spent playing with Steve Earle. When Guitar Town came out, we went and saw like the Dell Lords. We went to go see Steve at the bottom line. And I loved that record. I really loved that record. I loved the songs. And, uh, you know, I became a fan. We, we met him. We were friends and stuff. When he had his label, there were bands that I worked with that he liked. You know, he liked the Bottle Rockets. He got them on gigs. He liked Blood Oranges. And then I did a Sherry Knight record. And then he did a Sherry Knight record. You know, so we, we kind of, you know, knew each other to say hi and stuff like that. You know, I owned this bar in the East Village, the Lakeside Lounge, from 96 to uh, 2012. At one point, I was over there, and I got a call on the phone from his manager at the time saying, Steve's guitar player just quit, and we got like a world tour starting in like two and a half weeks. You know, your friend, the kid... Eric Christensen, uh, do you have his number? Because, you know, we'd like to talk to him. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. I I want this gig. And he was like, what? You got the bar and the studio and you're all busy. And and my thing was like, hey, if I'm my own boss and I can't answer this question myself, then I've got a real problem. And they're like, Okay, so, but I did say, I'll do it. I want to do it. You could send me the song list, I'm, I'm, but I can't even look at it for another seven days because I was just about to mix the Backsliders record that I did. I had to do that and keep my head in the, the gig on this Backsliders record, uh, the one that became Southern Lines, and then, then I dove in, you know, to uh, learn the songs, and um, it, it was really kind of, it was a wild thing. I, I really enjoyed playing with Steve. The, the songs were so good. And then when we started playing them, and also, you know, like Will Rigby had been in my band, and he had been on records that I produced, so we had a good musical co- communication. I was friends with Kelly Looney. You know, so it it felt like an instant ban when we started playing. But it was also uh, an education into the songs. You know, a song like uh, Someday with that amazing lick. I had no idea that that lick didn't come in till the end of the song. I thought it was there from the get-go. But, you know, like I had to learn stuff like that about the songs and... uh, well, it was five years, and I think we made three albums during that period, but we uh, typically, when a record came out, we'd do the States, we'd do Europe, then we'd come back and do the States again, and maybe some Canada, you know? And then I forget if we went two or three times also to Australia. So it was a lot of touring. And, uh, you know, great band, great guys on the crew, there were things that like, uh, so I've been playing music my whole life and stuff, but you know, and you pl- play, usually you do sound check and then you have dinner and you know, that this is all nicer than I'm used to. Then, you know, like after dinner, then there'd be these uh, more menus. It'd be, well, what's this? After show food. What? <laughs> they got after show food. It was cool, but I, I, and I also like to say, you know, like, uh, you know, I've had my own band, I've had bands that I'm in, like the Del Lords and the Yahoos, and, but when you're a side man, you know, you're doing a job, right? And you, your job is to do what you're supposed to do on those songs. And sometimes on a side man gig, when you're looking at that set list, you've got like, there's that one coming up there, it's like, oh man. You know, but with Steve, there was never one of those. All the songs are great. There was never one of those songs where we'd be like, oh, God, do we have to do this again. You know? Well, sometimes uh, Steve 
he would refer to it as the bottom of the big time. So we, we'd be playing, you know, the big clubs and sometimes theaters, you know, and the audiences were, they were great. You know, when I first got in the band, this was like early internet when they had these like, uh, it was before, way before Facebook or anything, but there were these message boards, you know, and there were these super fans that fucking hated me. They just, and they were, their idea of the band would be like, you know, fantasy football. They have these teams that have never played together, but a guy just thinks this guy and this guy and this guy are going to be great. They're not necessarily going to be great. So that was kind of difficult in the beginning for me. And I was used to, you know, as a producer and a band leader and a bar owner even, you know, I was used to, and a studio owner, fixing things. You know, it's like kind of my job to fix. And I had to uh, consciously, you know, I, I'm I'm here to play guitar and sing harmony. I, you know, like I let these guys do, that was kind of different for me. I, th I think what we did first is we played a show with Jackson Brown and Tom Petty came and then somehow we ended up on this doing dates with Tom Petty. Those guys were super nice, you know, especially uh, Mike Campbell, you know, like one of the first or second days I show up and they're at my guitar station. I, you know, I had to, to cover that gig, I had to have five guitars out there, tunings and capos and 12 strings. And, and I get there and there's, Mike Campbell is playing my custom painted Todd Hansen Telecaster, you know? And uh, and they were just like guys in a band. And he was like, yeah, man, if you wanna play my 55 gold top, go ahead. And I was like, I'm, I'm like, well, I, I use weird strings and I, I declined, but they they were super nice. Well, yeah, he had a like a, I forget specifically if he had one or two Princetons and he had a Vox and he had a, a not a Leslie, but the Fender Vibratone cabinet, which is the speaker doesn't rotate a, a piece of foam in front of the speaker rotates. I think they both had them. I mean, those guys had so much gear, you know, so much gear. And they, like, they really enjoyed it. You know, like, they were like like the Stones, you know, like when the Andy Babchek, his book about the Beatles gear came out, I was like, imagine if he could do the Stones. And then he did the Stones. Like, But the Beatles had, like, 15 guitars in their whole quiver through their whole career where the Stones had, you know, they were into the hundreds by 1970. You know, they went on TV shows with, with Brian and uh, Keith with matching Firebird 7s. That's like the Les Paul Custom of Firebirds, Gold Hardware, Ebony Fretboard, Big Inlays. And Tom and Mike were like that with their you know, okay, we're playing the Firebirds on this one, or, you know, like, they, you could tell they, they had real uh, joy out of the gear. And and if you, if you ever saw uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, you know, like, you know, Tom would do, he'd have one solo where he'd whip it out, do his solo, and it, and it just, it communicated, you know. It was nothing like Mike, but it wasn't trying to be. There was another, we had friends out there too, the guy, Steve Winstead, who goes by the name Chinner. He uh, was, who had also teched for the George Satellites. He was out there with them. And, you know, at the time, uh, Justin Earl was my guitar tech. Uh, it, it, it was really great. But then we got, it was a business thing. We got moved to the Mary Chapin Carpenter tour, uh, which was more of a co-bill, and I think it was a positive monetary thing. You know, it's expensive to have a full band. So that was, we only did like two weeks with Tom, but it was really, they were super nice.
the we that Mary Chapin Carpenter tour that I mentioned, I mean, those she was great and she had this great band, you know, with Duke Levine and all these guys, uh, Mark Goldenberg, another incredible guitar player. It was a great band. But the the audiences, the Steve Earle super fans and the Mary Chapin Carpenter super fans were really quite different. The first tickets went to the Mary Chapin Carpenter, you know, so there'd be all these women in the front and then the guys in the black T-shirts who are like, are there in the back. I don't know why, but the, the women in the front didn't seem to understand that they had a ticket with, and it was a reserved seat. But they would sit there through our whole set with their <laughs> making the pain face and fingers in their ear. And, and that was kind of that was kind of hard, you know. It's kind of hard, you know, because you want to do a good job and you you want to make that connection, but it wasn't quite possible. Oh no! Musically, it was cool. It was just that the audiences were pretty drastically different, you know. It was uh, we had a good time, you know. It was like uh, and you know, like Kelly Looney had been out with him for so long, and he was like a foodie before people called people foodies. And I mean, they had there's a lot of places that I went for the first time. Like I, I never heard about Pramani Brothers until I was out there with those guys, you know, in uh, Pittsburgh, you know, Pramani Brothers, have you ever been there? It's, well, it's it's like a super regional, it's, they make a, like a burger and a sausage sandwich that's served with slaw and fries on it, you know, and like if you ask for it without the fries, it, you know, it's like trucker food, you know, because this area where all the bars are there, now there are bars there, but it used to be like, you know, truckers would be there at four in the morning because they drove all night to get there and they get unloaded at six. So they have something to eat. And, you know, uh, yeah, we had a lot of a lot of great food, good times, you know, with the food. I, I just knew I knew that it would come to an end. And uh, five years was really good. You know, I played on a Grammy-winning record, and we did all this stuff. 